Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here this morning, and thanks to the organizer uh, for putting me on the program. So this <clears throat> paper is titled Language Skill Acquisition in Immigrant Social Networks, evident from Australia. And in a nutshell, what it will be looking at is whether there is any relationship between living in an ethnic or linguistic enclave and whether you well, quickly pick up the host country uh, language skills. So the question will be, well, is there any relationship at all between enclave size and language skills? And if yes, well, what's the mechanisms? Um, why would that relationship even exist in the first place? And one of the reasons uh, for even asking this question in the first place, and now I just realized that you do not see the title of the slides, but it says the economics of language acquisition and enclaves. Uh, but the reason for looking at this is that it starts from the very simple observation that in countries with very large immigrant populations, immigrants tend to be concentrated in very few large metropolitan areas. So in Canada, the vast majority of immigrants are located in either Montreal, Vancouver, and Toronto. In the case of Australia, that would be in Sydney and Melbourne. And many uh, policymakers worry that these high levels of segregation may have long-term long implications for integration, as well as on the native population themselves by uh, increasing communication barriers. Another possible consequence uh, of this spatial segregation of uh, immigrants has been documented by George Borjas uh, that looked at uh, how quickly the earnings of immigrants catch up with the earnings levels of natives in the US. And what seems to be the case is that the most recent cohorts to the US of immigrants uh, to, to the US have been experience, experiencing much slower rates of convergence in terms of earnings. And then the question is why is that the case? What is so different with these cohorts? And what Borjas found is that about 20% of this slowdown in earnings convergence can be accounted for by changes in the size of ethnic groups. And what this means is that the groups that experience the largest changes in size, whose population grew at faster rates, are precisely the ones who experience the slower rates of uh, earnings convergence towards native. Then the question is, well, why is it the case that these groups experience uh, such little earnings uh, gains over time? Well, it turns out that these trends really correlate quite strongly with slower rates of language acquisition, meaning that these groups who grew at faster rates in terms of size are also the ones who were picking up English language skills at slower rate. And so it begs the question, well, is it the case that ethnic enclaves or the, the, the special, uh, the, the fact that you have many, many co-nationals living among you uh, may be playing a role? So theoretically, it might be the case that enclaves do diminish uh, incentives to invest in new in host country language skills. Uh, here by incentives, I'm talking both about benefits and costs, so it could really be the case that li living in an ethnic enclave reduces the benefits of learning the language because you, it's simply easier to, to find a job, and so uh, it is less of a requirement on the labor market. But it could also be the case simply that it increases the cost of picking up this new language by providing fewer interactions or opportunities to practice the language, as was pointed out earlier, uh, on the job, uh, um, learning might be actually very important. Uh, if this is indeed the case, well, there's two uh, important implications. One is, as was said, it could reduce immigrants' long-term economic assimilation, if indeed this is the case that it reduces their language skills, because we know the returns, the economic returns to language skills are really large. At least in English-speaking countries, if you look at meta-analyses and survey documents, we're talking about a 15% a return in terms of earnings, which is roughly on par with the return to education. So this is a very, very large return. And then it could also be the case that it produces externalities uh, on the next generation uh, in terms of uh, decreasing the incentive to pick up language skills for the next generation of immigrants. And it could also just increase communication barriers, which are borne not only by immigrants themselves, but anyone who gets to communicate with them. The problem, though, uh, when we want to answer these questions of whether it is the case that ethnic enclaves uh, affect language skills, uh, is an identification problem. So the key challenge here is that immigrants do not locate randomly. Uh, I can't just compare immigrants living in different places, look at their English skills, and say that this is due, that any difference is due to uh, the size of enclaves, because this is not random. It might be the case that immigrants who find it easier to learn English have a lower propensity to locate in enclaves than people who might find it more difficult to learn English in the first place. So there's a clear selection bias here. Uh, a, a type of selection bias that is also very important in the case of immigration to English-speaking countries, as well as French-speaking countries as well, is that since these uh, language have a status of kind of a lingua franca, most immigrants will have some degree of knowledge 
of Angular before even migrating and may in fact sort into or out of Enclave on the basis of the language skills they already possess upon uh, migration. And so even if I were to run a regression of language skills on Enclave size at T0 the day they migrate to a given country, I could already find a relationship Whereas in fact, it can't be the case that enclaves had any effect since people had been living there only for one day. Um, if we look at the literature in a pure descriptive sense, there is indeed a very strong negative cross-sectional relationship between the stock of language skills at one point in time and enclave size. Uh, this has been documented in uh, many places. So Ed Lazier found that in the US uh, back in 99. Uh, Barry Chiswick and Paul Miller uh, document that, documented that in the US as well as in Australia. Uh, I highlighted this paper because uh, Casey Warman found that this was also indeed the case in Canada as well. Uh, and Christian Dustman and his co-author Fabri found the same in the UK. Uh, so this seems to be true pretty much across the board, at least in English speaking countries. The two research questions I want to address in this paper will be this descriptive evidence or this, let's say, correlational evidence well, does it really, uh, uh, is it evidence of a causal relationship that if you were randomly allocated to be living in an enclave, it would be the case that would, you would be learning English at a lower rate because of uh, enclaves? There's very little evidence uh, on this. Uh, there's many reasons. Again, the, it's quite challenging empirically to, to investigate this. Uh, to my knowledge, there's really only one paper who uh, credibly tackled this question. Uh, Danzari and Yaman used um, variation from a guest worker program in West Germany in the 60s, where very low skill immigrants coming mostly for, uh, from Turkey were randomly allocated to, to regions, and then they essentially uh, see uh, the language skills of these people 20 years later. Um, and they do find some evidence that enclaves seem to affect uh, your uh, likelihood of learning German. It's not really clear whether this is uh, appropriate for English-speaking countries in the 20th, 21st century, especially, as I said, because of English lingua franca status, where you actually need to take into account language skills even before migrating, which was not an issue uh, in this prior literature. And then the next question, and here I will only provide suggestive evidence, but I think this is where things get really interesting and more research should be done is, well, what drives this relationship? Why is it the case that enclaves even affect language skills in the first place? Is it that people make fewer formal investments in, uh, in language? Is it the case that they're less likely to enroll in English courses? Or is, has it more to do with the labor market itself and the fact that maybe they end up in jobs where they have fewer opportunities to uh, practice uh, English to begin with? Uh, and just to give you a quick preview, I will find absolutely no role for formal English courses in driving this effect, uh, but I will provide some very suggestive speculative evidence uh, that indeed um, the returns to um, language skills are smaller in enclaves in the sense that immigrants will still be able to find work, but this will be different types of jobs, jobs in which they plausibly have fewer opportunities uh, to practice English. Okay, so just to give you a quick idea of what this paper will do, uh, the setting will be Australia. Uh, it's a very nice setting to study immigration policies as well as uh, this, the role of enclaves simply because it has a large immigrant population, mostly concentrated uh, in large cities. So this is an ideal uh, setting. Uh, but also one of the reasons I studied Australia is that Australia happens to have a very nice longitudinal survey that allows you to track the acquisition of language skills over time. Uh, if you only have cross-sectional data, all you see is whether you are able to speak English well or not at any point in time. I have no idea whether you learned that before migrating or after. This allows me to start opening up the black box of language skills. Um, some people might ask me, well, the LSIC does that in Canada as well. Why didn't you use the LSIC? There's a couple of methodological reasons for that. We can, I'd be happy to talk about this uh, after if, if you want to. Uh, but uh, in this talk, I will be focusing on, uh, on Australia. So here, the idea will be to explicitly measure not only whether you're able to speak English, but whether you picked up new uh, skills, and also essentially control for your proficiency levels upon migration to essentially wash out any selection into enclaves on the basis of pre-existing language skills. Uh, in 
Part two, uh, for those who might be interested in running a bunch of robustness checks to make sure that these results are really robust, uh, I do leverage a very large set of rich, a rich set of observable characteristics uh, to generate bounds on these estimates. I'll also be using an instrumental variable uh, strategy, and I won't be presenting that today uh, in the interest of time, but all that to say that if you're interested, uh, these, these results seem to be fairly robust to different empirical strategies. What I want to spend more time on is uh, the mechanisms, uh, in particular the role of uh, formal English courses as well as possibly social interaction uh, on the job. Okay. Okay. Uh, so just to give you an idea of what data we'll be using, uh, this is called the Longitudinal Survey of Immigrants to Australia, uh, which was conducted actually quite, quite a few years ago. Uh, so this is a representative survey of all immigrants who uh, landed in Australia between September 93 and August uh, 95. Uh, so in terms of sample size, we're talking about 7% of the target population. Uh, but I know uh, many, many, many efforts were invested in making sure that this would be a representative uh, sample. For my purpose, since I'm interested in acquisition of new language skills, I will be explicitly focusing only on non-native English speakers, that is, those whose first language or best spoken language is not English. I will make sure to uh, have a balanced sample, and so on, I will only keep individuals who are observed throughout uh, the survey period, which leaves me with just over 2,000 immigrants who belong to 31 different uh, language groups. Um, what is nice about this survey is that uh, the data was collected in person, so three in-person interviews were collected over a roughly four-year period. Uh, I will be focusing on wave one, which will be kind of my baseline, so when I will be measuring language skills at uh, wave one to get a sense of how good were you at speaking English just after uh, arrival in Australia, and then I will look at wave three to track essentially the evolution of language skills over time. Uh, in terms of measures, how we get to measure all of this, my key measure of language skills will be a simple indicator variable that takes a value of one if you declare speaking English at least well. Uh, as was mentioned before, uh, it's a categorical variable where uh, people were asked, do you speak English not at all, not well, well, very well. The reason why I'm focusing on uh, well or more, is that if you um, break it down by category, you'll see that all the action is happening at the going from not well to well margin. There's very little impact of enclaves on, say, going from well to very well. And so that's why I'll be focusing on this margin. If you don't like that I am using a self-report, uh, then I'll complement this with a, uh, a different measure of English skills where essentially it will just be were you even able to conduct interview in English or not. Uh, uh, what was nice with this setup is that um, the, the survey administrator had a very large team of, an, uh, of interpreter that just went on the field, and so if you were not able to speak English, everyone had the possibility of conducting the interview in the language of their choice. Um, second, by enclave size, when, when I talk about enclave size, I need to measure this. I will essentially just use the fraction of people in, of language K living in area J. I will normalize this by the fraction of people of language K living in Australia. The reason is not to underweight very small uh, groups. And so you can th think of this as a, really as a segregation measure. So whenever this takes a value larger than one, it simply means that language group J is overrepresented in area K given its prevalence in Australia. And then it's not really clear how you, at what level of geography you want to measure this. Uh, many people would disagree with that. I'll consider two. Um, Two levels, one which is essentially city size, think of an, uh, a CMA, uh, and then I'll essentially zoom in and uh, focus on, let's call it uh, neighborhoods, of which there are uh, 64 in these data. Okay, so here's the, 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 the paper in a nutshell. These are not regression results, but this, this is essentially what will be happening. So here I'm just showing you the evolution of language skills from wave one all the way to wave three. And for illustrative purposes, I'll just break the sample in half. And people who live in above median enclave size, I will say they live in an enclave. And those who live below medium, I'll say non-enclave. And there's two things to notice on this graph is that according to both my measures, firstly, clearly there was already a difference between enclave and non-enclave resident that existed right at the beginning. 
So this is the sorting story right here. I don't want to be using this variation. What I want is to control for this and only look at what happens after. And so I want to be able to control for this difference to begin with. But then the second interesting pattern is if you look at the difference in proficiency levels between enclave and non-enclave residents, or should I say, sorry, between non-enclave and enclave residents, the gap actually grows over time, which means that people living outside of enclaves are actually learning at faster rates. So if we want to do this in a regression format to take this a bit more seriously, I'll be regressing language skill in wave three on this measure of uh, enclave size, as well as your past level of proficiency, which is the, your wave one uh, level of English skills, a bunch of predetermined characteristics that cannot endogenously affected by uh, enclave size. That includes age, gender, education. And again, they have so, so much rich information in there. So they ask them, why did you even migrate to Australia? Why did you choose the state you are located in? And so I'm going to be controlling for all of that. Uh, and importantly, I will have um, SSD fixed effects, meaning that if uh, in some places there's more English courses available and it affects all immigrants group the same way, I'm going to net that out entirely. I will also have language group fixed effects to control for uh, differences in linguistics linguistic distance to English, for instance. And so the coefficient of interest beta will be purely identified by comparing two immigrants who speak the exact same language but live in different places, as well as by comparing two immigrants who speak different language but chose to live exactly in the same place. So if we just put that in a table, uh, in column one here and four, I'm really just regressing enclave size on the quality of spoken English. Here I'm not controlling for lagged English, so this is essentially a replication of what's been done before. This is more of this correlational relationship, and you can see there's a strong negative relationship as has been found before, particularly when you measure enclave size at the city level. Um, in column two, as well as in column five, I now control for way more uh, individual characteristics, including your motivation for choosing where you resided, whether you asked or you are, uh, whether you expected receiving help finding work, whether you expected receiving help learning English even before migrating and so on. Uh, the coefficients shrink a tiny bit, but all, not all that much. Um, just to give you a sense of the magnitudes, uh, here a one standard deviation in my uh, measure of enclave size is associated with roughly a three percentage point decrease in the probability of speaking English, which is very much in the ballpark of what has been estimated before. What's actually interesting in my preferred specifications are columns three and six, where now I control for whether you were actually even able to speak English in wave one at the moment you immigrated. And so this takes care of this selection uh, issue into enclaves on the basis of your pre-existing language skills. And you can see that the coefficients are cut by about a third, meaning that in these cr uh, cross-sectional relationships, roughly 30% of your effect is pure selection on the basis of, skill, uh, of skills differences that already uh, existed. Uh, in terms of magnitude, so these coefficients, uh, a one third deviation increase in enclave size, roughly explain about 15% of the total change in language skills you observe in the raw data. So this is actually quite big. This is not a huge effect, but this is still uh, economically uh, significant. Okay, then I want to spend some time on the mechanisms. I think this is where this is getting a bit more interesting. Again, this will be more speculative. So uh, a first pass at this is to ask, well, who even are the groups that are affected by enclaves? So here I just break it down by gender, by education, by age, and I highlighted the groups that are essentially driving all of the effect. Uh, so there's nothing going on for men. All of the effect is driven uh, by women. Uh, if you look at education, uh, the category that I called middle are people who have more than a high school degree but no college education, and pretty much they're driving all of the effects as well, meaning that really uh, highly educated workers are insensitive to these uh, changes in the social environment. And then uh, workers who are aged over the age of uh, 35 do not respond to these uh, change incentives. Only workers who are below the age of 35 respond. Then I hope you can see this. The numbers are a tiny bit small. So here I'm using completely different uh, outcome variables to test for mechanisms. So first I'll ask, did you ever enroll in an English course or not? Uh, just note that at this time in Australia, all immigrants uh, had the right 
to 510 hours of English instruction for free, regardless of where they live. That could even be done by sending a tutor at your home. So th this was very accessible for pretty much everyone. Uh, and so money was never a reason not to take uh, these course. And what you see, if anything, the relationship is positive, meaning that people living in enclaves, if anything, were even more likely to take uh, English courses, which kind of makes sense given that they had more to learn to begin with. Uh, but what this tells me is that uh, this is probably not a mechanism that would explain the fact that they learned less. They did, clearly didn't invent, they were not investing less in these uh, English uh, courses. Uh, when you ask them, do you think there's a lot of contact between cultures in Australia? Uh, this is why I say all these results are very suggestive. Uh, none of it is really statistically significant, but if you do want to take the point of or at least the direction of the effect. Uh, seriously, it seems like indeed by living in an enclave, you do seem to have fewer contact with uh, other culture. Uh, if you look at uh, the relationship between enclaves and labor market outcomes, there's really nothing going on. And I think this is an interesting result. Uh, some people might think that it seems like the labor market does not really matter with enclaves, I see it in a very different way because we know there is a very large return to language skills. So it needs to be the case that there's different factors that are offsetting each other in this case. And actually, if we just fast forward to the, uh, the last column here, I just generated a measure of the return to proficiency. And so for each combination of language group and location, I calculate the difference in employment rates between people who are fluent and those who are not. And I just take this as a rough measure of the expected returns in terms of the probability you find work for each possible combination of language groups and, uh, and location. And indeed, there's a negative relationship, meaning that there's probably less of a, of a gain of learning English if you're living in uh, an enclave. And this is very consistent with this null effect on working. It just means that if you live in an enclave, you're just as likely to find work. Why? because the return to learning English is, is actually smaller. And in fact, if you look at these variables, where here I'm conditioning on people who do work, uh, the probability that they use a language other than English at work, again, it's not statistically significant, but it's going in the right direction. It seems like living in an enclave, you're more likely to be using other languages other than English. Uh, if I were to run this actually at the uh, SSD level, the uh, smaller neighborhood level, this one turns uh, strongly statistically significant. It tells me that there's definitely something going on. And it seems like they rely more on their social networks, probably within uh, the uh, linguistic community to find these jobs. So overall, this is very suggestive, but what this tells me is that uh, people are still able to find jobs in enclaves, but these are different types of jobs. Types of jobs in which, uh, that they found through social networks, in which they likely get fewer opportunities to practice English uh, in the first place. So I'll just wrap up uh, on this in terms of the results. Uh, it does seem like enclaves do affect the rate at which people learn uh, language skills. We're talking here about a one-third deviation increase in linguistic concentration decreases uh, learning rates by about 2.6 percentage point. Uh, but the, the key uh, caveat here is really that about a third of cross-sectional estimates are due to sorting other than a real learning uh, effect. Given large returns to proficiency, uh, this suggests that enclaves may indeed contribute to slowing down the economic assimilation of immigrants in the long run because they will uh, acquire fewer, well, language skills that are extremely important host country, human capital specific uh, skills. And then we can really speculate on the role of social interaction in, uh, in the workplace. Is it the case that the workplace itself contributes to the acquisition of language skills? It's kind of a chicken and the egg problem where is it the case that because I don't speak English, I can't find jobs that have strong English requirements, and so I don't get to work in these jobs that would allow me to practice English? So uh, what needs to be done first? Have people learn English or bring the, uh, uh, have them uh, get some work experience in place where they get to practice English? So this is really a very interesting, I think, policy question that warrants a lot of future research. And I think uh, Delia did an amazing job as telling us uh, uh, what is happening in the US on that front. Uh, thank you.